On today's episode of Lockdown Wilds, there are four heads on Mount Rushmore. So who would make it from the Minnesota Wilds? Your Locked On Wild, your daily podcast on the Minnesota Wild, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up? What's happening, everybody? Welcome in to another episode of Locked On Wild. We are your team every day, and we thank you for making Locked On Wild your first listen each and every day. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast platform so you don't miss out on any new episodes throughout the week. Today's episode of Lockdown Wild is brought to you by Indeed. Still searching for a great candidate for your company? Don't search, just match with Indeed. Start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash locked on. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. On today's episode of Lockdown Wild, Isha Jerome of the Soda Pod joins us as we debate who should be on the Minnesota Wild Mount Rushmore. We'll give each of our fours, and then we'll talk about the names that didn't quite make the cut. My name is Seth Topal, your daily Minnesota Wild insider. I feel like my sunburn gets worse every episode that I do back off of a uh, very nice vacation. And joining us... For his usual Friday appearance, Isha Jerome of the Soda Pod. Isha, what's happening? What's up, Seth? Not too much. Not too much. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta maybe take advantage of that. Indeed, here work's been a little slow this summer as well. (laughs) Well, I, uh, I'm right with you. I've, uh, I'm on the job hunt, hoping to uh, hear back on a couple of prospects, but the search continues, and so uh, we'll, uh, we'll continue to. uh, see how that plays out but uh this is a fun talker for today's episode because you see this on other shows where they'll say hey in a particular sport who would be on the mount rushmore who would be the most foremost prominent figures on the uh, mount rushmore of that sport well we're taking this minnesota wild centric now it's obviously going to be a little easier because there are only 24 years of history to go from but there still are some choices to be made, and so I'll let you present your case. I will present mine, and then we'll talk about the names that uh, didn't quite make the cut. So, Isha, you have the podium. Who made your Mount Rushmore? Uh, so, I mean, Kirill Kaprizov, obviously, yeah. already. I mean, franchise there's not, leader. There's, there's not much more to say, right? <laughs> yeah, franchise leader in pretty much everything. The only career records that he doesn't hold yet it's a matter of time and so it's just he's far and away the best player that's ever put on the uh, minnesota wild uniform and so any discussion like this has to start and end with him yeah because like you put in perspective like four years ago gabrick was still like the goals leader right and kaprizov is you know he's gonna smash that record right in like half the time yeah he should uh he should get well above that during his uh, tenure. So great first pick, obvious first pick. <laughs> yeah. But let's just, name yeah, let's, let's just tear the, the bandaid off right away. We'll get yeah. that one over with. My number two is Nicholas Backstrom. Okay. I feel like a lot of people, when they think who's the best wild goaltender, you know, they go Rolleston, they go Dubnik. I honestly think that it's Nicholas Backstrom for longevity with the, with the Minnesota wild. And, when he was with the team until his like last couple years where he still was playing, you know, 20 plus games, even though he kind of became the one B or, or took a step back in the well, goaltending carousels that were those, you know, 2013, 14 um, seasons, he was still a top goalie in the national hockey league and it would get people. He was so good that it would get people confused um, on sports on sports center at night when they were talking about you know the the anchors would say oh and nick baxter had a great game and you're going wait wait it was is it the washington center or is it the minnesota yeah. wild <laughs> goaltender right and it was and where he dominated was kind of post jack lemaire trap type of play now he was kind of that transition goalie towards the end of jack lemaire's tenure as coach but it he didn't rely on the system in front of him to kind of 
boost his numbers. And that's no disrespect to the goaltenders before uh, the goaltenders that brought this team to a conference final just, you know, uh, three years into their existence after the expansion year. But again, longevity and yeah, he just has that over the Dubniks, over the other names of goaltenders you want to throw out there who've been staples for this team. So I think you have to put Nicholas Backstrom up there. Uh, let me let me just look at all the different areas in which he is still the all-time leader amongst goalies for this franchise. Games played, he has 409. Next closest is Devin Dubnik with 328. He's first in wins. He's first with 194. Next closest is Dubnik with 177. Uh, he is first in saves all time with 10,321. Devin Dubnik next with 8,470. He's fourth in save percentage with a 915. He is fifth in goals against average with a 2.48. Most shutouts in franchise history with 28. Uh, every important statistic, he is either leading or in the top five. And, you know, we talked about this when we were putting uh, a couple of different times, actually, when we were putting together the ultimate wild team. Uh, I was just floored by the consistency. Well, and, and not, Wilson has some of those numbers too. He played what four years? Yeah, with the Wild. So, and Backstrom, like you, you just, I was just floored by the, and not not only just being consistent, but being consistently good. And you know, go back to two thousand eight, two thousand nine. Seventy one games started. As a 30 year old, he started 50 plus games in one, two, three, four, four different seasons. He had 40 plus in two others. Um, and, you know, you had a couple of shortened seasons in there. He he just put together an unbelievable uh, amount of uh, good quality seasons. I mean, that 2008, 2009 season in which he started 71 games, he had a goals against average of 233. Yep. And a save percentage of 923 and also had eight shutouts. And so it's not like he's just not like he's just good enough to stay on a roster. He's like he he was putting up numbers that, you know, are just below the like Hall of Famers of the sport at that time. Yeah, like he was top goalie in the NHL for like a good f five to six year run. Right. And every, and yeah. to put in perspective too, EA sports was always ranking him like 89 to 90 as well. Right. Like he, he was recognized league round as or league wide as well. Um, and, and I think even past just like the casual fans, like if you were playing fantasy, if you were playing, you know, sim league back then on, on HF boards and things like that, like he was always someone to target in that upper echelon. Yeah. Just, just consistently good, consistently above average. So that's a great, number two pick, but uh, let's get to your three and your four. Uh, Marion Gabrick is, is number three. Yeah. Um, he, he was the first and arguably only superstar in Minnesota wild history before Kirill Kaprizov uh, joined the team. And, you know, th there was potential that Kevin Fiala would have become, you know, a, a name at like a superstar status as well, given the, given his development on the team and, you know, the 80 plus point season that he put up and was well underway to being that type of player. Right. But uh, again, before Kirill, it was, it was Marion Gabrick and he didn't play a good chunk of his career in Minnesota, right. Between Oh one to Oh nine. It's just, it's a shame that, you know, he, he kind of faded after what, 2012, 2013. And if he would have been with the wild in those years as well, uh, other than, you know, when he wasn't with the New York Rangers, it just would have been like, it, it would have been like how we just treated Kirill in the opening yeah. segment. It would have been like, well, obviously it's Gabbard, but because half of his career was in Minnesota and the better half of his career, despite his Stanley cups coming in LA, um, sadness all around, um, <laughs> his, his best years, performing on the ice were with the Minnesota wild with the a under Jack Lemaire for the most part, that was a very defensive team and he was still able to put up the points and score the way he did and be without anybody else really at, you know, at his yeah. level. 
yeah, he was he was really doing it by himself um, for a the better part of his tenure. Now there were guys that would come in periodically that uh, that helped you know chip in, but it was pretty much the uh, the Marion Gabrick show to uh, to say the least. Well, so, especially in the playoff run too, right in the yeah. 2002 2003 playoff run where he was pretty much point per game. Uh, right, just to, just, just one under, out, yeah, outrageous, um, outrageous run. Uh, in some of those seasons. So that's number three. Who's who finishes out your Mount Rushmore? God, see, four is tough because yeah. four is where the question comes in. Because I, for me, anyways, it's like there's that step below those three guys that we just mentioned, right? Bonafide mm -hmm. top goaltender in the National Hockey League for years, uh, bonafide first superstar the Wild has ever had, and then second superstar the Wild has had in Kirill Kaprizov, who, who still have in Kirill Kaprizov. And then I feel like this is like the next tier down. I feel like you could make an argument for so many guys. You can make an argument for Koivu. You can make an argument for Parise. You can, and I know people are going to hate this, but like, I'm sorry, look at his stats. You could make an argument for, for Ryan Suter. You can make an argument for Spurgeon as well. I think for me, it, it has to be Koivu. It has to be Koivu for longevity, for... The type of player that he was. Now, I, I know that Minnesota Wild fans and, and the argument that comes out of Minnesota and, is that you know, he's not as good as everyone here made him out to be for so many years. Sure, but he was consistently a second line tier center. Now, they yeah. had to play him at the first line or their 1B or whatever, whatever it was for so many years. But man, there was a good stretch for like I want to say like four to five years were like 40 plus uh, assists in the bank every year. Two-way numbers in like great two-way numbers in the bank every year. Face off great face off numbers in the bank every year. So everybody knew who he was, yet they still couldn't shut him down, right? And the fact that he was pretty much, <laughs> pretty much only a Minnesota Wild player other than that, very small run that he had in Columbus. That flirtation with the Columbus Blue Which, Jackets. By the way, uh, Hoppy, uh, the co host and co founder of the Dow Soda Pod, uh, he uh, he has the, the Canon Columbus Koivu uh, jersey. <laughs> he doesn't Why have not? the Minnesota Wild one, he has the Canon Columbus Miko Koivu jersey. So, it's a collector's again, item. Yeah, you, and God, that jersey is beautiful. <laughs> you, you could make an argument for so many other guys, and even looking in like the history books, like you could go back and you know, there's some there's some older players too in that like first wave in the first you know five to to seven years of the Minnesota Wild existence uh, after 2000 in the expansion draft that you could make that argument for. I, I think realistically, it, it's 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 one of Koivu, it's one of Parise, it's one of Ryan Suter, it's one of Jared Spurgeon. Okay. We've got a different number four, so uh, I figured I, we would because there's so yeah. many, there's so many names, right? Yep, and I so that means I get to spend a lot of my time uh, discussing my number four, but I'll, I'll go through and talk about the uh, like we said, there are three pretty easy choices here, and then there's a fourth. So, tell me, uh, tell, be honest with me though, did you have Backstrom on your list? Yeah. Okay, okay, I like it. I like it. And I by do. the way, since since uh, this might be a curveball, I have a curveball for you because no joke, Seth. As I was prepping this show, I thought that we were talking about the Mount Rushmore of teams throughout the Minnesota Wild history. So I have I have oh. a whole page of notes on Rushmore of teams. So I'm just gonna okay. give you that uh, after the break as well. Sure, we will. Uh, we'll discuss that, and we'll talk about some names that did not make the cutting room floor. All coming up as we continue today's episode of Lockdown Wild after this. Today's episode of Lockdown Wild is brought to you by Indeed. Folks, we are driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search, match with Indeed. If you need to hire, you need Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Best part is listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash locked on. Just go to Indeed.com slash locked on right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. 
That's indeed.com slash locked on. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Welcome back to today's episode of Lockdown Wild. Once again, we thank you for making Lockdown Wild your first listen each and every day. For your second listen today, make sure to check out Locked On Twins as the Minnesota Twins continuing to uh, try to keep pace with the Cleveland Guardians up at the top of the uh, AL Central. Brandon Warren does a fantastic job hosting Locked On Twins, so make sure to uh, give them a listen here uh, to finish off your day. Also, make sure to give some love to uh, everybody at the Soda Pod. Isha, Hoppy, Spoke Z, A+. A+, content all throughout the week, whether it be my Monday appearance, MNCAA, Judd's Buds, uh, Fellowship of the Rink. I'm going to... I, I don't know why, I but I just... the show. I put more time into producing that show more than any show on our little network we have now. And I still butcher the name, which by the way, Liam Ugrin, the next guest on that one. And, Ooh. uh, and we have some other, we have some other guests to tease the next time I, I stop by locked on as well. Big shout out to everybody who sent in their mailbag questions for Joe Smith of the athletic, uh, and uh, hoppy as it was a full on mailbag episode in the last one. And you guys, you guys asked some great questions. So thank you. If I can't get the name right, I'm just going to start calling it the one with Hoppy and Joe Smith. <laughs> Joe Smith's <laughs> podcast. I'm sure I'm sure Joe would, would love that if people start just calling it Joe Smith's podcast. <laughs> Hoppy's got no ego, so Hoppy would love that as well. There we go. Just just get that crowdsource. Get we're that coming going. for you, Russo. We're coming for you. <laughs> All right. So we're talking about Minnesota Wild Mount Rushmore, and I love actually, Isha, that you uh, you put in the time to do the Mount Rushmore of Seasons. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about my fourth. Then we're going to talk about some of the names that were worthy of consideration. And then in the final segment, we'll talk about the Mount Rushmore of seasons. Awesome. So we can uh, can get that its proper due. Because as you alluded to, it's three pretty easy choices. I have Kirill Kaprizov. I have Marion Gabrick. And honestly, my opinion on Nicholas Backstrom has changed tremendously since I had a chance to see the numbers. Uh, uh, again, the fact that he just consistently was an above average goalie is impressive. And to do so with the number of starts that he had, I feel like if you're having a conversation about goaltending at all, the conversation has to yeah, start now. He was an him. all-star. He was an all-star. And it sucks that there wasn't a good team in front of him because yep. he could have he could have brought them far in the playoffs. I it, it feels like too, I, I I think Devin Dubnik gets a lot more of the love because of how good of a run he had when he was on well and he saved them if because they were in like a goalie carousel and Backstrom was yeah. on his way out and and the biggest factor is he was horrendous in Edmonton right he yeah. was so bad he, he was almost going to retire before he was 30 he was that bad and then gets a second chance works with the goalie staff in Minnesota starts tracking the puck in a way that you, the national hockey league brass and, and goalie coaches respectively have never even taught how to track the puck. It was so unique. And so he like paved the way for, a, for quite honestly, a, a new type, a new fashion of playing the position. So all those factors together, I think are, are why people kind of go to Dubnik first, but no man, Nick, Nick Backstrom was the guy. Uh, Dubnik had, you know, when he first came to Minnesota, he had that run 2014, 2015, where he had the, he went 27, nine and two with a 1.78. Yeah, how how do you do average. in the Blackhawk series though? Uh, that did not go well. And, you know, he had a couple of other really good seasons too, but let's like some of the other seasons, I mean, 2018, 2019, when he started 66 games, he was 31, 28, and six. And so it's like it was, it was just a short, it was a shorter flash in the pan. Like yes, I, I mean, thank you, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it was because he wasted a lot of his good years in Edmonton. Yeah. Because no, he was a young goalie that came up with the Eberlays, with the Halls, with the new Nugent Hopkins, or whatever. And I that cast and crew just didn't work, right? Yeah. No, so they lost so much. And he was he was like 
literally going through like depression and stuff like that because Edmonton's a hard most Canadian markets <laughs> except for Ottawa are, are hard to play in right it's a tough yeah. it's a tough place to play in and and especially with all that young talent that went through there and and their rebuild plans rush the rebuild plan of rushing these young guys I mean Dubnik got thrown into the fire man and and yep. I never thought he would be good I, I dude I was in like I think second year university my second year of college when he was when he was brought in by the Minnesota Wild and I was laughing I was like what the, what the hell are they doing bringing in Devin Dubnik man and I was like very much like hockey was like it was like studying and hockey that was my life yeah and um I, I don't I wouldn't even think I was like drink drinking that year I think I even like put drinking on the shelf because I was focusing on good grades and hockey and so I was dialed in and I would have never thought that he would have panned out the way he did. So I remember that run vividly, like texting my friends, going out of my way to watch wild games, you know, back when I was very much just following the Canucks and just like hockey as a whole and the WHL and honestly more WHL than even NHL, given that I had season tickets to the the local Victoria Royals at that point. But man, like I remember there were, there were people who didn't follow the wild back then hard, like just as hardcore as even I started to when I began to have an interest in them and then starting the podcast, my casual Canucks friends were watching wild games because that's how crazy that story was. <laughs> yeah. It's just lightning, lightning in a bottle. And that, that three year run was fantastic, but you know, I feel like Backstrom has the longer body of work for sure. Oh, yeah. So that's, that's why I go Backstrom there for a goalie. And my fourth, I'm going with the coach. I'm going to Jacques Lemaire. Hey, I like it. I like it. Because think about this. Like when when he came to the uh, the Minnesota Wild, he was picking a team up from scratch. Like he was brought in to help lead just this bunch of guys to uh, to try to put a competent team together and they didn't have a lot of young talent it was just a lot of veterans who were who were fine right who who yeah. were good but like cliff running towards the end of his career despite him still putting up points it was like towards the end of his career and then you have a very young gabrick and a, a young cast of guys that didn't even know and most of them didn't even pop respectively yeah and it, what it led to was obviously that improbable playoff run in uh, 2002 2003 but it also produced, you know, a first place finish in 2007, 2008, a second place finish in 2006, 2007. And so the fact that he came in and yes, there were some lean years, but that's to be expected from an expansion franchise. Nobody, rarely it happens that you have like what happened with Vegas, where they just pop immediately and you're able it to doesn't just. doesn't happen in any, any yeah. pro sports. It's not. no, it didn't happen to Seattle and, uh, it, it just it, it'll it, never happen again. It yeah, you know, in our lifetime, anyways. So the fact that he was able to within a couple of seasons get them into the playoffs and get them to where they were able to finish in the uh, the top part of the division, it's impressive. Well, and it's, imp it's impressive too, Seth, because like you look at since then, right? Whereas the Wild have had, like you said, really good seasons. But then they get in the playoffs and they're figured out easily. Jack yep. Lemaire was so good at, yeah, employing a, tra a trap game overall, but he was so good at adjusting in the playoffs, something that <laughs> Dean Evison couldn't do well. Shoot, I love Bruce Boudreau. He couldn't do well with the cast and crew that he had. Yep. It was just Jack Lemaire got the best out of his guys, but also was able to... He was like a chess master. Use the pieces around him to, to kind of throw off other other coaching staff on the opposing benches as well. And that's what was so great about him. Now, was it the most exciting brand of hockey? No. Would it leave you like, would you, would it leave your heart stopping at times because the games were that close and you were like, Oh my God, it only takes one and, and they're over. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Dude, I saw that on the other side as a Canucks fan in, in 2002, 2003, right? Like the, the Wild were down. We thought we had it in the bank. And then we're like, what the hell are these close games? What is going on here? Why is West Wall scoring these goals? What is going on? <laughs> love you, Wes. Oh, the coach. Just uh, just love. Absolutely have to put him in as a part of the Mount Rushmore. So like today's question for the, the listeners, uh, just comment and uh, we'll get the best response in our next episode who's on your mount rushmore who is on your minnesota wild mount rushmore dig deep 
I know there are going to be some that uh, because of what he brought. I want to see somebody put Bugard on their Mount Rushmore. Do it. Do it. I mean, I've I wish I did now. To be honest, I, I'm I'm having regret not doing that myself. So. I think I think most like people who know me are probably like, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't put Bugard on there. He's my he's my number one honorable mention. He yeah there yeah there you go. I think just a tremendous fan favorite and. You know, we talk about the honorable mentions here just briefly, but like you alluded to, Parisi and Suter, I think, are honorable mentions for sure. Jared Spurgeon, I think a couple more years of what Jewel Erickson Eck is doing, and he is definitely in the conversation. Oh, yeah. Um, And, you know, the exciting part is we've got a whole crop of young players that if their careers pan out the way that we're hoping they do, that are going to be in this conversation. This too. is the best prospect pool the Wild have ever had. Yeah, and it's and it's not and it's not even close. No, that it, this this blows anything out of the water under Chuck Fletcher. Uh, blows anything out of the water. I, I mean, Paul Fenton wasn't here long enough to uh, to really build one, but Chuck Fletcher always like he had that initial crop of young players that came up to the NHL pretty quickly. But then there just was never anything like waiting in the wings beyond that. Yeah. So this this far and away, you're you're 100 right. Far and away the best prospect pool this team has ever had. And so some of these guys will certainly factor in to the uh, equation before it's all said and done. But I'm curious now that we've got the players. I'm curious as to the seasons. So we'll finish by discussing the seasons Mount Rushmore list for Minnesota Wild history as we finish today's episode of Lockdown Wilds after this. Today's episode of Lockdown Wild is brought to you by FanDuel. Folks, we had the Major League Baseball All-Star Game, which means that the sports world was almost at a complete stop. And you know me, I love my sports. So anytime we get a sports lull, it bums me out. All the sports aren't sportsing the way that I would like them to, but FanDuel is here to help you out. They can keep the sports going whenever you want. All you have to do is open the app and dream up bets anytime you are in the mood. And this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There is something for everyone every day all summer long. So head over to FanDuel.com and start making the most out of your summer. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. Welcome back to today's episode of Lockdown Wild. Once again, we thank you for making Lockdown Wild your first listen each and every day. Reminder, next week, now that I uh, have had a chance to get some sun, as uh, those watching on YouTube can see quite uh, quite clearly, like I just have to tilt my head slightly and you can see those uh, sunglasses lines. Uh, I was outside pretty much the whole time, which was great. But obviously you you pay a little bit of a price there. Uh, we're we're going full bore with prospect week next week. And I'm really excited for this because the aim of it is going to be to give you an opportunity to learn the names of the players that are in the system. Because as we as Isha and I just talked about, it's the best that the Wild have ever had. And so we're going to talk about the names, when you could expect to see them, and in the case of a few particular prospects, full episodes diving into where they're at, what they can bring, and where we go from here. I'm really excited for this. I hope you enjoy it because um, as I had a chance to see over the, uh, the last week, the listeners really love the investigative stuff. So we're going to do more of that here. Unlocked on Wild, Isha. Let's finish. I'm glad you. Uh, I'm glad you put this together because this was a perfect spinoff for the Mount Rushmore conversation. You went to the level of putting together the Mount Rushmore of Wild seasons. So yes. let's uh, let's dive into this. So number one, obviously, 2002, 2003. Like the season itself was good. As the, it was their best year thus far. They had 42 wins on the season. Like I said, a heart stopping run is the best way you can describe the playoffs. Um, they had the good old trap. They had an amazing coach who got the most out of the expansion team. Uh, amazing goaltending. Good mix of young talent and veterans. 
like what a, that, that comeback against Vancouver again at the time it made me sick as a young as, as a kid <laughs> quite literally a little kid watching I was like who the who the hell is this Minnesota Wild team and and like who have no business being here but hey they had business being there and it was a tremendous comeback they stamped their ticket their only ticket to the conference finals in their history the the knock on that season was the end of the run it's like yep. they didn't go out swinging right the, the duck series was one of the most boring conference finals I have ever seen in my lifetime because the ducks played the exact same way. They had the trap game, except with just better talent on the team. And yeah, they were able to, they were able to win that one. But uh, overall 2002, 2003 was just, you know, it, it's on the Mount Rushmore. It's one of the best seasons and playoff runs. And I'm putting season and playoff run in the same bubble here for, sure. for, for this, the best years in wild history. Yeah, storybook run with that 0203 team. And you talked about it. And it's the reason that I can't listen to the song to this day because Anaheim just got uh, jiggy with it. <laughs> well, that's Jean- me and Chelsea Dagger, but I'm sure the Wild fans feel that one as well. Jean Sebastian Jaguer just absolutely put the clamps on in that series. And. As a result, I, I, sorry, Will Smith, I, I can't listen to that song for <laughs> even a second to this day. Oh, and man. I wasn't even a wild fan back at that point, but I just, as a Minnesota sports fan, you just develop a seething hatred for particular players that stop your team from being able to make playoff runs. And so he's on my list. Yeah. He's on. He, I'm Steve Buscemi in um, in Billy Madison. He's on the list. <laughs> Now, I left off 2006, 2007, and actually 2016, 17, because yes, they were really good seasons and they put up 48 wins in 07, 49 wins in 17. They lost in the first round and it, like, yeah, it, it just it didn't it go was anywhere. So, it was so disappointing how they were just I- exposed so easily. So, despite those seasons being good seasons, the playoff kind of put a hamper on it. So, the next one is 2013, 2014. Um, in 2013, 2014, the, they had a lot of depth. They didn't have any superstars, but they had a lot of depth. Now, Prize couldn't stay healthy for 82 games. If he did, then maybe he could have been their only superstar as, as he was still freshly coming from New Jersey where he was, you know, an 80, 80 point player at that time. None of the young guys that you, that you alluded to in Fletcher, uh, drafting, none of them had popped yet, but a good chunk of them were really good. And, and they just weren't able to carry the team in the top six. So when the, yeah. So when they had to get their minutes elevated, when they had to make adjustments, like the teams that they faced in the first round were able to, were able to shut them up quite easily. And we saw that both in 07 and in 17, just with a different cast, uh, of crew as well but hey at least in 2013-14 they were able to get past the first freaking round 43 <laughs> wins 27 losses and 12 overtime losses this was the year um where right before dubnik had arrived so this year like imagine if they had a goalie it was a goalie carousel that year man an absolutely yep. crazy goalie carousel when they, where they went through josh harding Ilya brisgolov darcy kemper john curry and nicholas backstrom like that's how many goalies suited up for that team that year brisgolov playing for getting playoff games too and and yeah far from the brisgolov who was you know a backup in anaheim and and played well in arizona <laughs> He did not play well in Philly. That's why I left it off that list. Um, I loved how Jason Palmerville was an absolute beast that year, putting up 60 points and even 30 goals, 30 assists. Um, Prize was an absolute beast in the playoffs, but he just didn't have any help. Like he was the yeah. one carrying the offense in the playoffs. So Palmerville played okay in the playoffs as well, but it was, it was really the Prize show in the playoffs. And I, I really think if there was a goaltender and some, and if some of those young guys were just even a step ahead in their development. They they could have they could have done well in the second round. They could have done well in the second round. Now they kept running into this dynasty Chicago Blackhawks team as well, but it is what it is. Um, number three, I have the next year, 2014, 2015. And this was the acquisition of Devin Dubink. Now it was a goalie carousel until he came over, and like you said, he was absolutely amazing. Uh throughout the season, it was a 46 wins, 28 losses, and eight overtime losses. Again. 
they looked so good in the first round and then absolutely destroyed, swept in the second round. Again, Parise just didn't have much help in the playoffs as well that year. And let me just bring up his numbers because he looked so good. Yeah, 10 points, four goals in 10 games. Again, Palmonville was six. And then Granlin had six as well, but only two goals. Everybody else had like three, four. I think there was one player who had five. Yeah, Nino had five. But like Parise was was carrying his team offensively yeah. anyways in uh, in those two series. But it, overall, the year was really good. Nino had his first career hat trick. Backstrom, who was just on the way out, had his 400th career game, and he he still was he still was helping out back there. He still was patching the hole until Dubnik came and just kind of took over. Um, Prize was really good, but that was the year where I kind of figured, okay, like he's not the 80 to 90 point Prize that we saw in New Jersey, but if he stays healthy, he can still at least take charge in a game or two. Miko was still dominating in the two-way play and had a whopping 48 assists on the on the on the season. And this was the last time, the last time that the Minnesota Wild had won a playoff series was back in 2014-15. So I had to I had to give him that one. Yeah, just just by just by default almost. It's like you win a playoff series and your season is gonna get elevated above everybody else. Yeah. And my last one is actually 21 22. They were second in the central. They were second in the West. They had fifth, did a career uh, franchise leading 53 wins, 22 losses, and seven overtime losses. Um, almost half of the lineup had career years. They were such a dangerous team on paper and in the season, and arguably the best team that the Minnesota Wild have ever iced in yep. history. And 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 I personally I personally think it's not even close if you look at how everyone performed. Kaprizov hit 100 points, Kevin Fiala had 85, Zuccarello 78, Hartman 65, Eck 49, Goudreau 44, Felino 42, Spurgeon 40, Boldy 39, Brodeen 30. Like dude, the Minnesota teams in the past, like the 07 team that we're talking about, like these guys were hitting 60 70 points, right? I mean, yeah. uh, Gabrick aside, you know, they, they were the Minnesota Wives have historically been their top guys hit 60, if you're lucky, 70 points, other than their first superstar in Gabrick. Whereas this team had monsters. And you look at the defense, too, they were defensively sound. You look at the depth they had, they they had amazing depth. They had the 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 Jeek line buzzing as well. Like they were such a hard team to play throughout the season. But what a collapse in the first round where oh. St. Louis, again, was able to figure them out. Dean Evison yep. just could not could not adjust. Obviously, there was a little bit of drama with the, the goalie distribution and, and the Talbot and Flurry. And who do we go with? Why do we switch them out? Talbot's wife be texting. But anyways, um, only Kaprizov scored in the playoffs as well. That That's what's absolutely insane. Fiala dried up Kaprizov in six games, had eight points with seven goals, man. Yeah, I, I remember because it's so crazy, too. That That is that's going to go down as one of my favorite seasons because that wild team, they both bullied you like because that was that was the height of the, the grief line at their full power. Like I, I, they, it got until the postseason before they had a, a goal scored against them. Yeah, in the entire season, like they just bullied people, and they also had all of those empty net comebacks that just made the season crazy. It made it feel like they never were out of a game. But then, like you alluded to, they got up two to one against the Blues, and Craig Berube lit his notes on fire, and just said, "All right, this is what we're gonna do." And they went and did it, and the Wild had no answer. And it just was it was infuriatingly frustrating because Kirill had the one game. I think it was in game – I think it was in game five where he had two power play goals and nobody else – nobody else got on the score sheet. Again, he had seven goals. The next leader in goals was three, and that was Erickson Eck. Yeah, you. They scored 16 goals that series, and 10 of them were by Kaprizov and Eriksson Ek. Nobody else had. Nobody else had more than one goal apiece. No, because he he was healthy. Well, yeah, healthy, healthy for a playoff run. Anyways, no one's really healthy at that point in the season. Let's be perfectly honest. Um, but they shut down. They shut down Fiala, dude. And I remember yep, that like, was the key. 
They they shut down Fiala and like no one had really there wasn't even really enough tape on Kaprizov yet for like yeah there was a whole season and everything but you know like now people kind of know like he we we've seen he can be shut down you know in some nights whereas he was just utter confidence put the team yeah. on his back and was buzzing night, while going nuts while every other line was matched up beautifully by Craig, Craig Berube. Yeah. So um, it, it did make the list because, you know, despite that collapse in the playoffs, like the season itself was, was unbelievable. And it was such a tremendous season to watch. Yeah. I, I, I can't make any objections to anything on your list. Uh, I, I would say, I think the playoff seasons have to be on there for sure. Um, and then, you know, maybe you make a case for, some of the best regular seasons they've ever had for the fourth spot, but honestly it's the best regular season they've ever had. And so that's the just, thing, right? It's like yeah. round two of the playoffs, two of them conference finals. And then like the best regular season they ever had, whereas you had two ones that were close, but, and just, you look at the, the cast and crew that were on that team as well. Like you had a hundred point player the first Alex time Skoligoski that the Wild never had a hundred point player. Alex Skoligoski was a plus 41. Bro, did, didn't he, didn't he like almost get 30 points too? Yeah, he had uh, he had exactly thirty, dude. Like that, <laughs> like that's what I'm saying, bro. Jordan that's Greenway, Jordan Greenway had ten goals. Bro, Dumba had twenty seven and fifty seven games. Like, imagine if he wasn't hurt, right? Yeah, yeah. It was. It really was a true like what could have been if they would have bro. been able to go on a run that postseason. Yeah, it was. It was wild, dude. It was absolutely wild. Um, yeah, literally. Yeah, it was it was, it was awesome, and then <laughs> and then we and then we you know in typical wild sadness just absolutely collapsed in the the first round. I was like, what the hell is going on here? That uh, uh, game six, I against um, a good St. Louis team, but like not the Stanley yeah. Cup St. Louis no. team that had like the magic behind them, right? No, they were very clearly because it was it was Colorado, it was Minnesota, it was St. Louis. They were very clearly the third of those three teams. Yeah. Very clearly the third. It's just. That was the, the co- like I said, the, the coaching battle and the goalie battle won that one. Yep, hundred yeah. yeah. percent. Uh, what a fun! Uh, that was a fun exercise. That was a great way to kind of look back at Minnesota Wild history. And so I'll throw this out for the listeners too. Two part question: Who makes your player Mount Rushmore, and who makes your seasons Mount Rushmore? Leave it in the comments. We'll get to the best responses in our next episode. Uh, and uh, just a perfect way for your Friday. We got two episodes for you. Uh, just to get your weekend started. We'll be back to a regular schedule for next week, so make sure to uh, keep things tuned to Locked on Wild. Hit that like button before you head out for the day, and uh, make sure to uh, give our friends over at the Soda Pod some love here as well. You can find new episodes every Monday through Friday as part of the Locked On Podcast Network.